One thing is fairly clear in a world where a lot of their properties have been struggling, Ubisoft are going extremely deep into Assassin's Creed. And actually, for those of us who enjoyed the series' past, there might be some good short-term news as well as, uh, well, to be honest, a pretty damn massive future plan that does show their they're betting a lot on this franchise. Yeah, and not only are they betting a lot on Assassin's Creed, which for people who really love Tom Clancy's, uh, they may find, oh no, you're, what are you going to do to Assassin's Creed? Please don't bet on it too hard like you did with that. But the thing that everyone has wanted from Assassin's Creed since the very dawn of the series is finally coming true. And you can celebrate that if you'd like, if you have faith in it being good. Or you can look at it as, I kind of, my first initial thought was, wait, they're doing that? Holy shit, they must be desperate. <laughs> they mu this must be like, absolutely, this is the final card in their deck to play. And that is Assassin's Creed Japan Edition. Jesus Christ. Yep, that too, which, uh, yeah. funny enough, Team Ninja are also doing. <laughs> Rise of Ronin, yeah, yeah. it's going to completely mug it. Whoa. There's quite a lot of those. But uh, yeah, right, so Ubisoft Forward happened. They announced quite a lot for Assassin's Creed. Not so much in the other things. It was mostly just kind of like live service updates, uh, that yeah. sort of thing. But right, Assassin's Creed. Well, there are six new games planned and a Netflix project, and the one that's coming out the soonest is Assassin's Creed Mirage. And this is the one that had a little bit of a drama over yes. the whole real gambling thing, which has turned out to not be true, by the way. And it's coming out in 2023. And the funny thing is uh, it's not a 7 trillion hour, 5 million square kilometer open world RPG. It is a smaller, more focused Assassin's Creed game, a bit more similar to the older ones, where, yeah, you play as Basim. Uh, your mentor uh, is the uh, same actor who plays Christian in uh, The Expanse, which is extremely good news. And, yeah, big old uh, setting in Baghdad. Awesome. Wait, so it's Assassin's Creed, it's the Assassin's way Assassin's Creed kind of originally was? Yeah. As opposed to, why is this, you know, quality enough? massive open world rpg been called assassin's creed when it doesn't really feel that way they're actually making assassin's creed yeah it's an assassin's oh. creed that will focus in more on stealth and uh assassinating things that's that's in the name assassin yeah oh. crazy God. yeah and you'd wonder how it took them this long to get to this point honestly but at least like someone at ubisoft seems to have woke up and went oh yeah here we go and it must have been a while ago enough too for this to be releasing in 2023 so maybe maybe there's a little bit of a like there's a cog in Ubisoft brain somewhere still actually working, which is good news. Yeah, well, I think for a lot of people who are sort of the more core uh, fans of this franchise, mm -hmm. um, apart okay, while the modern day plotline has never really been that good, the whole thing of the actual Order of Assassins has yeah. been more preferable, and that's mm -hmm. kind of taken a little bit of a backseat uh, recently. Whereas if you think about the time period here, you know the setting, some similarities to one. Um, I just think that's overall pretty well set up for people who, like me, were there when the franchise began. Now, the funny thing is, the origins of this are not as a standalone game. It was actually ah. as a DLC for Assassin's Creed Valhalla. They just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and then at some stage, they make the decision to, instead of doing a big DLC, to just turn it into Mirage. And you might be thinking, wait, Baghdad? Assassin's Creed Valhalla? Well, actually, <laughs> yeah. history's really interesting, and sure there's is. reasons why that actually does make sense. Hmm. But obviously, you know, they might as well take the good opportunity to pull it out into a different game. And that's like, that's, I guess, kind of perfect. Where it's like, hey, we're just going to Assassin's Creed game, we're going to make it. And they kind of got there in a weird way. But it is what people have wanted from video games, especially big publishers for the longest time, is, can I have a video game that I pay, pay for? And I play it and it's over? please thank you yeah that's what i that's personally what i would like um having 100 plus hour games is all well good fine there's yeah, a good place in the market for that but a shorter experience is more focused um that yeah. also would work for me yeah we want both basically yeah now one of the things with this is uh, it was very heavily rumored that there would be a remake of assassin's creed one mm -hmm. as a part of the season pass for this game and it turns out that does not actually seem to be the case. They flat out said there is no AC1 remake in development, and the uh, like collector's edition mm. does not have a uh, yeah it doesn't have a season pass. That's unfortunate because that's like the prime example of when you should do a remake. Because obviously everyone else in the universe is doing a remake. Yeah. I think like because how many people are like fans of Assassin's Creed now that especially because the series grew massively with the last couple entries. 
how many people have played one to know? Because that's the thing, like Mirage, you talk about like where Assassin's Creed's roots are, kind of the story that people like really start to enjoy in one and two. It's like, how many people are fully aware of that and like know what it feels like? So that's exactly the case where obviously there's a lot of times where remakes and remasters are lazy for like, ah, what do we do? Eh, remastered? Blah. Well, Might as well. This case is just like, hey, people literally don't have the history of this IP, so make it playable, make it there, so especially. Th that's yeah. true, but um, if we, well, when we get on to Assassin's Creed Infinity, yeah, it comes down to opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. And with the Assassin's Creed 3 remaster and just them having quality issues with some of those, um, I mean, there's obviously the continued laughing stock of Prince of Persia. Uh, right. Yeah, that's so a good point, yeah. Maybe they just don't feel like they're really able to do that. Now, there was one drama that spilled out onto the internet, and this was really funny, because the Xbox uh, store page listing said uh, that it had an ESRB adults-only rating, including real gambling. Now, this is weird, because the actual ESRB has got no listing for Assassin's Creed uh, Mirage. And uh, the Instagram re-upload of the Mirage trailer uses the rated pending. Uh, image and then only 27 games have ever received an AO uh, that includes like Manhunt and stuff like that yeah. a lot of consoles actually won't even carry AO games so overall it would be extremely surprising if that happened and then Ubisoft themselves were very confused that any of this happened <laughs> and they just said that there is no real gambling and there are no mm. loot boxes quite weird but uh, the other thing we do know though is that this is like maybe the last Assassin's Creed of its type before we enter this big new era of Infinity. You might be wondering what the hell a Assassin's Creed Infinity is. That's what a lot of us have been wondering as well. And the core of it actually comes down to Infinity is almost like a big launcher, yeah. almost like a big hub. Assassin, it's like yeah. the thing that you open to do Assassin's Creed. Yeah, it's Assassin's with, Creed as platform, basically. Yeah, Assassin's Creed as a platform. And within that, more Assassin's Creed content gets added, right? So there's a way where this could actually end up being quite a good experience, right? You, you know, you go into Assassin's Creed Infinity and through whatever its UI is, you, you know, they just can add like DLCs and expansions and full-size games and all of these things to the overall uh, Infinity uh, experience. I actually think there's really, there, there's a way where this could be very nice for players. Like if you were to imagine you boot into it, big old map, Loads of like, you know, icons and markers of the various different places, or maybe they even go a little bit more, um, you know, like a, a little bit more immersive or something like that. Um, but I guess you just can see this idea of like, this is the home of Assassin's Creed. You boot into it and, you know, you can experience all the different time frames, and periods and all that stuff and games and different experiences. And maybe if they just want to do a small little side thing, well, that's fine because Infinity exists as somewhere where they can put that. Yeah, that's the thing where... I was worried about this idea primarily whenever we talked about it before because the idea of, well, this is Infinity, this is like the core game to everything we build on top, that's what I expected it to be. But as they go into, they talk about, like they said IGN, the intent is that Infinity itself is not a game, it's a launcher. And that means that if they don't tie themselves to, you know, basically, if you can load a completely entirely different game, an entirely section of code, an entirely different engine from Infinity, and it's not like, a, you know, all in the same kind of code like framework and stuff because that would like limit you for a decent amount of time without c having to do like i guess the the existing problem we see with live service games and mmos where you have to consistently rebuild if you're working off a base core in terms of like the technical stuff like we see you know, like world of warcraft really struggling with being like a 17 year old game at this point in time yeah. and they have to just, there's so much technical debt they have to work through all the time and that's what i'd be worried about them setting up but it seems like they actually like I, there's no way to put this without sounding a little bit mean but it seems like they actually have their head screwed on for a change and they actually almost more than almost anyone in the industry they're actually looking at this and going would a game technically a game technically framed as platform and launcher work yeah but we have to do it properly and they seem to have actually done it properly because i can yeah. imagine i can imagine figureheads be like what it's the what if it's a big game that has all the games in it and then someone technically minded went I can find a way to spin a version of this that works to the big CEO as that. And yeah, then it's actually I, going to mean you're not going to be held back by, you know, hey, it's time for the PS6. We'd like to make a new Assassin's Creed in Infinity. Sorry, it runs at 30 FPS. Yeah, or sorry, I, I think we can't. Like, 
done well, this could be a nice natural evolution of the way that they've ran Valhalla, which mm -hmm. has, for the people who like that game, certainly been a success. And it's also been a financial success for Ubisoft, right? Yeah. So, like, they're saying that they'll mix premium box games with paid for and free content. Mm -hmm. um, they talked as well about Invictus, which is a standalone multiplayer experience, yeah, which if, actually yeah. could be quite cool. Um, the sort of social stealth that Assassin's Creed had was like kind of interesting. I don't know if they're going to do that. I or mean, Invictus, but it, nice. If and this is this is putting a lot of like, I don't think anyone at the creative de development team of Ubisoft would have the idea. But I'm even imagining things like I don't know. Maybe I don't know if any Assassin's Creed has had like decent multiplayer before, or even if there's Indies that do the same thing. But I'm imagining you know the way Hitman's found su like supreme success in like speedrunning. And all these ideas of like all of like the customizations and stuff, the idea of an Assassin's Creed multiplayer where you were all put in like separate parts of the map around and you have to get the one target, but maybe pick up a couple things along the way or something would actually seem like it would like there's really there's sub substantial potential for, I guess new and innovative multiplayer kind of tips, in yeah. and around that, it just needs to actually you know be made and if they have the platform, and they can plug in something like Invictus and they can get a couple of like a couple maybe even if you're using existing assets you can get a decent handful of devs to fire together and you have the tools then it seems like Ubisoft are actually theoretically of course actually innovating on how games are being made as opposed to what we've been hating them for for years and years now which is just genre entry after genre entry without yeah. doing anything new and like what they're saying here is that uh, kind of when it's not all just like one monolithic box product like yeah. Valhalla they can basically uh, I mean they they say in like interviews um actually supporting each experience within that for a longer time with more content ended up just saying think of it as a single player MMO rather than what we've done in the past so I think the point there basically is they can just keep on adding stuff and I suppose maybe if it's a few years down the line but they want to do something in the Valhalla timeline they could just do a new thing Right, so there's a way where they can do this, and it's a natural extension of Assassin's Creed Valhalla. And you think about what it's been able to deliver to people. I know that there's kind of like mythological content. There's the Siege of Paris. I think there's a bunch of surrounding content there. There's Ireland. There's probably more that I'm missing out on. For Odyssey, there was all the Atlantean stuff, right? Like, so they are actually making quite a diverse set of experiences. They're, they're being more creative with it. So it's all kind of interesting. And then we've got the more esoteric of their experiments, which is codename Hexe, hmm. right? So this is... This is a bit weird. This is um, being developed by Ubisoft Montreal with Clint Hawking um, as the creative director. It's set in 16th century Europe. That's kind of interesting. It had a trailer that had, well, it's got spooky forests, summoning circles, the Assassin's Creed logos, this like really cool effigy, right? Like almost like a, you know, Blair Witch like situation, Witcher, yeah. bumping into something like that. And what they've said is, it's not, a, it's not an RPG. When I say a different type of game, I want people to go beyond the expectations of Origins, Odyssey, and Valhalla. They're, an all, they're all an iteration of our current RPG design, right? But Hexy and Red are taking different tracks, and we'll get to Red uh, soon. Now, if you think that's it, no, there's even more, right? So there's also Jade. Now, Jade is a free-to-play, triple-A, RPG action adventure Assassin's Creed for mobile devices that's set in ancient China with a standalone story and character creation. So, yep, we'll see how they monetize that one. Certainly, that's a really cool time frame. I'd like to see all those things done well. Yeah. They, I think, obviously know that if they can get something set in that time frame, I mean, look at how Total War Three Kingdoms yep. moved over to the Chinese market so well for Sega yeah, and Creative Assembly. I guess that's one of the things Ubisoft has largely been missing. Probably because they're, you know, like, so French and European, they kind of miss out on the Chinese market a lot by virtue of, like, their creativity and what they deem to make. But it seems like that's actually a really good play for that. Especially because, uh, well, like, not having played Odyssey and Valhalla, I don't know how well they do the mythological elements. I've heard they're pretty, they're, they're pretty, fun. they're really nicely integrated, so they feel, like, pretty, you know, intelligently made, especially when they're, when they have such a focus on historical accuracy yeah. or, or not, you know, historical accuracy as it suits their purpose it's like feeling yeah. authentic not necessarily yeah. being realistic yeah yeah that's the authenticity feel is like i think doing that in china is going to be like fairly difficult but also the potential is incredible like even people looking at you know black myth wukong and you kind of get this immediate sense of oh this region of the world has such a deep and rich mythology it's really really cool to explore 
from like game development, but also when you're playing, it's just like, this is really, really yeah. sick. And the idea of them starting to do that in different ways. And also, I guess this is fundamentally my the thing I'm worried about with these, and that is them all being kind of copy-pasted gameplay-wise. But uh, them saying that about it's a different type of game going beyond the expectations, assuming that's not all bluster, the idea that this kind of mid-Europe like supernatural thing based on witches plays differently and substantially differently than how red's going to play than how valhalla plays that's like yeah yeah you're actually you're actually doing what people want out of assassin's creed they will really need to do that because i remember when they had revelations assassin's creed 3 assassin's creed 4 there's assassin's creed 4 uh freedom cry there's assassin's creed rogue there's assassin's creed it's liberation like i think there's another one like they were just at this period of time where they were just shooting out so many Assassin's Creed games, you know, you've got, uh, oh, the French one, Syndicate, and a lot of them are feeling very similar. They don't want to get into that situation of oversaturation again. Yeah. But I think they're also almost certainly aware of that, considering they really ran aground and had to really take stock of what they were doing again yeah. before they went ahead uh, to do Origins. Now, also, there's a live action series that is being done by the showrunner of Vikings Valhalla and Die Hard. I did not know there was a Die Hard TV show and as for Vikings Valhalla, I'm not really sure about its uh, quality. I, mean, I literally don't know. Um, and also, there's an Assassin's Creed game that is for the Netflix mobile gaming offering. Quite a lot. <laughs> That's uh, a now, <laughs> The next Assassin's Creed game after Mirage and the first on Infinity, that is going to be much more audiences would expect. And that game is codename Red. Feudal Japan. Feudal Japan. That's, so, you know, it goes to show, I mean, the way, the, I can't remember who will said it, but there's someone on the Assassin's Creed team where Ubisoft said a long time ago that they're not going to do Japan because everyone expects it and it's too simple. It's too, like, obvious. And I was like, that kind of vibe. And I was like, would you get your head out of your ass? Everyone wants it. It would work really well. Why not do it? And now it seems like maybe it's desperation. Maybe it's just, wait, that was a great idea. Now they're actually finally doing it. Yeah. So what they've said is that it's the uh, basically an evolution of the open world RPG design. So this yeah. will be an evolution of the ethos that we've seen in games like Valhalla. Goes to the Shima, 0.75. <laughs> Well, I guess the thing there in its DLC content is it could yeah. go a little bit more into, like, Japanese myth, which yeah. actually could be pretty damn cool. Yep. Um, but overall, makes sense. I mean, Valhalla's passed a billion in revenue. They Jesus. know that this format of game does work really well. The only potential issue is that Jonathan Dumont... Uh, Dumont? Dumont? Who knows? D Dumont? Uh, Dumont, that's probably it. Um, so he's been appointed as creative director. However... Uh, there was, uh, you know, allegations leveled against him uh, yeah. last year about being an abusive and controlling figure who in many ways was sort of embodying a lot of the problems that were faced um, at Ubisoft or basically, uh, you know, verbally abusing staff members, you know, to the point of tears, um, homophobic slurs, just generally being a kind of offensive, uh, targeting women, telling women how to dress or when they should smile, all Jesus this Christ. weird shit. Um, apparently, this was an open secret, according uh, according to game developer sources. This is at the mm. time of things going on, um, saying, you know, Dumont might have been the perpetrator, but Ubisoft management were complicit. So there's definitely eyebrows being raised that, uh, you know, that this is still going on. It's kind of uh, undermining things that um, Eve's, uh, Eve's uh, Gil Gilmo, yes, Gilmo, was saying, uh, you know, last week about how they're evolving as a company, and that takes us, I think, very naturally, on uh, on to that because, um, yeah, he, he sort of described it as a uh, as a stumble that the company has since acknowledged and learned from. Yeah, there you go. Difference there being learned from and solved all the problems immediately, yeah. and that's the awkward part. Is like if. If they're going to build red under Demon, and he's just treating his staff like shit, then that's not going to be that's not going to be good for an overall experience for either the game or obviously the people working there. Yeah, and so no, that doesn't fly in how like people look at developers these days. Not so he said it was a stumble. He went on um, acknowledging the attrition the company has experienced, but saying that they hired more than four thousand people last financial year, Ooh. including uh, six hundred people that were rehired, as well as senior people coming from other companies. Of course, Axios were quick to then uh, just reaffirm that they've uh, Ubisoft themselves have basically declined to discuss really any specifics with actual named staff when it comes to uh, you know the various different reports. So that also. Is maybe rubbing some people the wrong way. Um, Gilmo did say 
uh, though that, uh, well, he framed things in an interesting way about this stuff, and I can understand what he was getting at, because standards do change over time. I think people could maybe say that uh, as newer generations are more aware of things, yeah. uh, expectations for standards increase over time, right? Like, so there was a point in time where, you know, it wasn't a good thing, but a, a more madman-like office is actually just what people expect us. And, you know, it may not have been good, but they kind of dealt with it. And we're not saying that's a good thing. It's just those are like those norms uh, of the time. But what happens is as people communicate more and, uh, you know, they're maybe less punished for like union behavior and stuff like that. Um, you know, they talk to each other. They think about, hang on, we shouldn't really accept this bullshit and those standards increase and increase. So uh, what Eve said was basically that the company was running and there was the way that things were done. And now there's a new younger generation coming in with different needs. See, it's like, I wouldn't say different needs. I would say different expectations because information has came out from the people who yeah. came before about the shit that the newer generation, you know, probably shouldn't put up with because it's a load of bullshit. Yeah, that's exactly what he said. Then I think we didn't adapt fast enough to what people expected and needed. And there's a little bit of kind of like a, you could read this as it was all completely fine. And then you could say, well, no, it clearly wasn't fine. But there's the argument that maybe it kind of actually was, it was fine for the like size where you know if you're in a group of four people you can have all the banter you want but that group becomes 10 people and then there's a lot more moving parts and you have to literally by design for that group size be different actually act differently and that's a thing where that's just the entire industry seems to have done that because they were all just a load of mates and in, in a room hanging about making stuff and then suddenly they were corporations and they didn't become corporations fast enough and that's fundamentally it, where it's yeah. like the communication style is kind of awkward, but I understand what he's saying in that obviously there was clearly years and years and years of them being too big and not behaving well. So I would definitely say it's a little bit more than a slight stumble. It's more like many, many, many years of not solving a very important problem. But fundamentally, the reasoning kind of there, I think. Yeah, and I think overall, like, their position is definitely that they've made a bunch of, uh, you know, effort that they're solving the problem and they can just kind of continue onwards. That said, if you take uh, a better Ubisoft, which are like an employee advocate group, mm. they are um, not particularly pleased by any of this. 25% uh, of the original signatories have in fact left the company. Yep. And for some things that they've said, it's basically to the effect of, you know, it's, <laughs> is it almost like, you know, priests? Because mm. of course, you know, being, being from Ireland, or, you know, that it's like, okay, we'll shuffle the priest to a different parish. So it almost seems like people have been kind of shuffled around, changed uh, roles. Uh, some people have been given more responsibility, which is, uh, you know, kind of weird. And uh, now they are saying alleged abusers because there's cases where things can't be fully verified. They are talking, though, about like, you know, a, a number of the more notable names who were, um, you know, being inappropriate with staff. That those people, um, you know, they, they weren't fired. They simply resigned. So they've kind of faced nothing. They've just kind of, you know, shuffled off mm. and... You know, that kind of thing. So overall, it's basically Ubisoft saying, we're strong and stable, we've sorted it out, but they are in a position where there's a lot of attrition and not necessarily all of their staff are buying that. Mm. Uh, the yep. other side then is the hostile takeover. Yes. <laughs> so Vivendi were attempting a hostile takeover of Ubisoft. And to cut a bit of a long story short, essentially what happened is the... Uh, uh, so, Gilmo Brothers Limited, which is the company that the Gilmo family basically exercised control of Ubisoft through. Um, so, Tencent have a 49.9% stake in that company. And overall, what this has effectively done, to not go through all the boring shit with you, is it means the Gilmo family has secured their position as the leaders of Ubisoft. They also have got a powerful ally with Tencent. They're saying that a core part of the negotiation is they can do whatever they want, that their future is absolutely their own to decide that it, Tencent are just there as a financial partner, ensuring that they have complete ownership of the company. Yeah, I think that was really interesting because I was expecting Tencent to throw a load of money at Ubisoft, but I didn't expect it to be literally like as a, as a play to hold control of the company with the like games. I think that was really fun. Like it just just because I imagine, right? And this is just, maybe this is just me having a uh, wild imagination and seeking drama, but the idea of like, say in like 10, 15 years time, there's just a just a documentary that's like, the basically Godfather, but the game was instead. 
and they're all just like going through all this drama trying to keep control of ubisoft all this like inter-family drama how they handle this whole like all these abusers being their friends and stuff i just imagine this because it's like a family thing i just kind of have this vibe going forward of like oh this is it's ubisoft it's a family business it's just like the you know what are the stereotypes you know just the, like the pizza place down the street or whatever else are the stereotypes in like american media it's like yeah it's just a, it's the old the old family game developer making assassin's creed forever and ever and ever i don't know there's something like there's something weirdly cute about that that i kind of i like that over like the activision blizzard approach where this is just this is full american capitalism at its finest so overall, this just seems to be them drawing a bit of a line in the sand saying, hey, uh, Infinity, this is how we're doing these things going forward, rather than the, you know, the yearly game treadmill or the game every two year treadmill. Assassin's Creed is now going to be operated as a massive big life service. Almost think about it more like an ongoing single player MMO, where basically if somebody likes Assassin's Creed, there's a thing they can go into and they will consistently receive a hell of a lot of Assassin's Creed content. Their hope that they are basically betting that franchise on is that the Assassin's Creed Valhalla model can actually scale up to a larger experience and still retain users. And I think while Valhalla is maybe not massively for me, just in terms of its overall runtime and it being like a bit overstuffed and Mirage is more kind of my thing, well, if there was more Mirage-like stuff, I'd be happy. And certainly a lot yeah. of people do enjoy the Valhalla and Odyssey-like experience. So for them, if this just means a whole bunch of content, then... That could be good. So there's a way where this is used in a good way. There's also a way where this is used in a bad way. We're just not sure yet. Mm -hmm. um, will they turn other franchises into the, you know, this sort of mega game, mega studio uh, sort of development style? That's the problem, the, right? That's the problem. Will they will they just take it thick and try to apply this to everything? Or will it be smart? Because it works for Assassin's Creed, right? Yeah, I don't think it would work uh, really well at all for the other things. But like for Assassin's far, like Creed... Far Cry Infinity. <laughs> yeah. So for Assassin's Creed, I think it can work. Yeah. Um, now, there was another funny little bit of news, which is $70 is the new normal for an Ubisoft AAA. Of course this it is. This is exactly what everyone should have expected. We've been talking about this for like two years at this stage. Um, it's just naturally going to happen if you want to see our analysis of game prices. We did a video on that like two weeks ago. Yeah. But overall, that's that. So for yeah. Ubisoft, they're trying to draw a line over the sand, say, hey, here's our big, bold new plan. Everyone is doing some sort of open world game set in Japan. And I guess this will fight against the um, uh, way of the Ronin. What rise of rise, rise of, the of the Ronin? Rise of the Ronin, and this is where I think we we fall into like the the kind of analysis of video games because you can think about all their plans and all the IP they're working on all the games. You can go, okay, sweet. Here's Assassin's Creed Mirage. Here's Assassin's Creed Codename Red. Here's Assassin's Creed Hexa. And you're like, they still have to make these games actually good. Oh yes, that's the thing because. Like, uh, I saw people, and obviously I have a very skewed um, Twitter feed at times towards one side of the industry or on the other. Uh, thankfully, it keeps me sane. But I saw people, you know, say like, oh, well, here's Assassin's Creed announced they're finally doing Feudal Japan. And then, you know, Team Ninja show up and go, hey, so are we. Deal with it. And like, Team Ninja don't have the reputation for having the best games, like, in terms of how they're presented. But they're way fun. Yeah. They kick the shit out of anything Ubisoft make for fun any day. So it's like, can Ubisoft make their Assassin's Creed games, not all sludge. That's the only thing left. Everything else is like, basically, the 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 pins are set up, they just have to knock them down with good games. Yeah, so that's that. Enjoy the next thousand years of endless Assassin's Creed content. Yeah. With that said, we'll see you next time. <laughs>